To Winston Churchill, the finest hour for Britain was after France had sued for peace and Britain stood alone facing the Nazi German war machine. But for a regular soul like me, the finest hour was not when Britain struggled to avoid total annihilation, but when it ruled the world during the Industrial Revolution. Officially, the Industrial Revolution started in 1760. Joseph Malord William Turner was born 15 years after that. When Turner grew up, he witnessed a Britain full of hope. Let's use one example to illustrate. The Royal Academy of Art, founded in 1768, seven years before Turner was born, was tuition free. Some may ask, what's the big deal for that? Let me answer that by simply comparing Britain then and America now. Today, the American students have to pay astronomical tuitions and fees in exchange for college diplomas. Many of them are forced to take student loans. In 2005, the bankruptcy law reform lumped the student loans with the criminal fines and child support. Making them essentially non-bankruptable. As a lawyer, let me just say that bankruptcy is a legal tool to restrain those who recklessly lend to those who could not repay. It is a measure to protect the weak from being enslaved by the strong. Without that restraint, reckless lending would take place and take off. That's precisely what happened. In merely five years, the outstanding student loans surpassed the credit card debt, and it kept shooting up with a reckless increase of tuitions and fees. As the schools do not teach personal financing, many students, especially the underprivileged ones, do not understand the disastrous consequence of underwriting debt beyond their ability to repay. When I was teaching physics in a community college in Los Angeles, I was explicitly told by the department chairman not to teach, but to usher the students through the system. I foolishly argued that, since we were all there already, we might as well do some educating. I promised him that would not fail anyone. I didn't, but my contract was not renewed at the end of the semester. Now think about it. This is actually normal market behavior. The students believe that they need diplomas and good GPAs. They, like everyone in every circumstances, want to accomplish that with minimal work, which means studying. For teachers, it is to their best interests, of course, to meet that customer demand, which is to give students high grade. With the least amount of work, which means teaching, they happily comply. The net effect is that our educational system increasingly turns out unqualified graduates. The private sector, of course, is no fool. In the end, graduating with high GPAs, the students all of a sudden find themselves with unbankruptable college loans, but without much prospect. For the promised high-paying jobs, the unbankruptable student loans become their shackles for life. Therefore, the so-called Bankruptcy Abuse Prevention and Consumer Protection Act of 2005 should really be called the College Tuition Abuse and Lender Protection Act, or better yet, let's screw up our Children Act. I'm not an expert of filial cannibalism, but at least. Some animals eat their offsprings to eliminate the weak. The student loan does not impact the best students nearly as much as the secondary ones. Interestingly, that's not in accordance with the political correctness propagated by the colleges, which claim to help the underprivileged. But you're not so naive to think that they practice what they preach, right? When they say that, their eyes. Are on your pockets. So these ivory tower lords are just like everyone else, only maybe more hypocritical, under the cover of political correctness. 
hoping the students would willingly fall into their traps. And falling, plenty of them did. An overwhelming majority of college students today believes in socialism. Many friends of mine, who had escaped the socialist China, A.K.A. the hell, found their college-going kids believing in socialism. When they try to explain their experiences, their kids simply countered by claiming that they were evil. Obviously, these young people are going to figure this out the hard way, with much frustration, pain, and desperation on the way. I'm not going to talk about those parents paying for the increasingly useless diplomas, in the form of loan guarantees. Somehow, these parents. Do not realize that signing on that dotted line means giving their retirements to the colleges. When Turner entered the Royal Academy at the age of 14, free of charge, he did not face those challenges. To demonstrate, let's put up this oil painting of his, "Fisherman at Sea," which was his first painting exhibited. At the Royal Academy in 1796. Today, the socialized educational system—yes, I do mean socialist—teaches the kids to desire the life of caged animals, so they want to be fed instead of go hunting. Of course, as socialism goes, when everybody wants to be fed, there will be nobody to produce. Even if we disregard that, there is a fact. That the life expectancy of the animals living in wilderness far exceeds those living in cages, with guaranteed food and healthcare, three times longer, according to some reports. The reward of heroism, or the pleasure of success after multitude of failures, is the kind of hormonal high that no drug could replicate, with a powerful calming effect. Which is often called confidence. With that calmness, come reason and sensitivity. That's what we see during the Industrial Revolution. Risk-taking, sportsmanship, and gentility were in. Instead of being violent and frustrated, we see circumspect, calm, gentle, and sensitive youth who wrote poems and produced sentimental paintings. Watercolor became the choice medium. This is Turner's watercolor over pencil on paper of the transept of Ewenny Priory in Glamorganshire, Wales. It was done when he was 21. With his use of color or lighting, we see glory, despite the dilapidated state of the priory. Let's look closer and keep in mind. That this was done before impressionism. In the last episode, we showed Goya's milkmaid, where the impressionist use of color was for decorative purposes only. Here, the lighting was used to transform the scene, so we feel the glory of God in this rather dilapidated and empty hall. In other words, the color was playing a critical or defining role for Turner. This is the harbinger of modern art. We can see that this painting is sentimental, mild, and in no way offensive. So it is easy to understand the high market demand for this type of paintings, traditional, with only the slightest hint of revolution. This is the interior of Salisbury Cathedral. Even without the transformative message, we could easily feel the sensation through the color. From this point on, Turner always had more orders than he could fill. Money was no longer a problem for him. In addition, he was elected an associate of the Royal Academy at the age of 24, so there was no lack of respect by his peers. With his ever-improving financial situation, in 1797, when he was 22, Turner traveled to the British countryside. 
For those who are familiar with Britain, he went to the Yorkshire Dales and the Lake District, both national parks today. The boy, who grew up in the crowded London streets by the polluted Thames River, was introduced to the majestic expanse of the British landscapes. The magnificent big skies, mountain ranges, gorges, lakes, streams, waterfalls, and certainly storms. There must have been some kind of revelation for him, and he certainly transferred the sensations onto the canvases. The summer outing became a routine for him to make landscape sketches. In 1802, he expanded his reach to Europe. Besides nature, he spent time in the Louvre to study, among other things, color. While he continued to paint for the market, just like Goya, he started to spend time on what we call today modern art. Many of his modern art paintings were not put on stretchers. It was probably a smart move to keep his good boy image from being torn apart by the venomous tongues of the critics. As late as 1939, some 50 of these wonderful paintings were discovered at one time in the basement of the British National Gallery, simply rolled up and forgotten. Since our topic is modern art, let's pay special attention to this group of paintings that he spent a lot of time on, but purposely hid from the public. As a technical note, synthetic colors become newly available at that time. So Turner could experiment with different colors without too much concern for cost. Artistically, besides landscapes, living in an expansionist seafaring nation, there should be no surprise for Turner's love of seascapes. We have seen his Fisherman at Sea. This one is called Dawn After the Wreck. The title was not Turner's; it was given by John Ruskin. There's no shipwreck in sight, but according to an exhibit label at Frick, the painting imbues the coastal scene with a sense of solitude and even despair. The intense crimson clouds, the feeble blood stain on the sand, to quote Ruskin, and the lone howling dog. Do you get it? For this painting, we have no doubt. About the subject matter, which is clearly a beach scene. Besides the mornings after, Turner was of course interested in showing the movements themselves. That's when dramas took place. This one was called "Rain, Steam, and Speed: The Great Western Railway." At the first glance, if you haven't read the title, you might have wondered what this picture was about. But after spending a little time with it, there should be no doubt of the subject matter. If you still have any doubt, the bridge on the left should confirm that the painting is about a train crossing a bridge over the river. This was Turner's way to express movement. As movements go, the hardest to paint are probably fire, clouds, and water, because of the complex and unstable nature of the motions. For fire, let's look at two paintings titled "The Burning of the House of Lords and Commons" in 1834. This is the version of Philadelphia Museum of Art. This one is held by the Cleveland Museum of Art. For clouds, this one is called "Snowstorm." Hannibal and his army crossing the Alps. This is called Ulysses deriding Polyphemus. This is Godal. Incidentally, since we are on the subject of skies and clouds, I want to point out that for some reason, Turner liked to paint rainbows in white. 
Here is an example called Buttermere Lake, with part of Cromac Water, Cumberland, and a shower. His titles are sometimes too long. This one is called Kilchurn Castle and Law Call. For water, the Fisherman at Sea, and Dawn after the Wreck, are good examples. From those paintings, we saw Turner's mastery of the skills to reveal the sensations of movements. But that's not where Turner ended. He went a step further by showing the sensations without the subject matter. I'm not going to read or show the titles of these paintings because they inevitably reveal the subject matters. If you're really curious about the subject matters, you can look them up in the credit section at the end. Here, I will just let the painting speak for themselves. Look at the wash, the scratches on the canvas, and the emotions that come through without much subject matters, if at all. Let's watch and enjoy. Okay, this last one did not hide the subject matter that much. It is called the Northam Castle at Sunrise. Painters know that it is easy to copy something before them, acting like cameras, but a lot harder to paint the essence of the scenes, especially without the subject matters. I don't know what you think about these paintings, but I think Turner managed the essence extraction quite well. Turner lived with his father, who acted as his assistant until his death in 1829. It was said that he had two daughters with Sarah Danby, who was some 10 to 15 years older than him. Turner never married. Before he died of cholera in 1851, he had lived at the home of Sophia Caroline Booth, where he was known as Mr. Booth for about 18 years. After the death of his father, he was prone to depression episodes, which were often triggered by the sales of his paintings. Clearly, he was not a man needing money. I want to say here that his mental situation was definitely not as bad as Van Gogh's. The extraction of sensations from the subject matters is purely an act in the realm of modern art. When Turner died. Chazan, Monet, Degas, and Gauguin were all born. We have come to the modern era. I'll see you next time.